Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in to See Alaska Heritage Institute's Culturally Responsive Education Lecture Series. My name is Christy Dillingham. I work as the Education Director here at SHI. This is our last and final lecture of this series. Um, stay tuned, we will be sponsoring another series. Um, it's an art lecture series next month. Please check out our website to find out those details. But the goal of this lecture series is to unveil the educational inequities and social injustices that have long been part of the educational system here in Alaska. The series has featured presenters who have spoken on topics to help the community expand its understanding of the legacy of colonization and the impacts on education as it relates to Klingit culture and history. This series is part of SHI's goal to promote cross-cultural understanding. SHI has been working with educators through our Cultural Lens Seminar Series for the past seven years and through our Culturally Responsive Education Conference. And we'd like to expand that conversation into the broader community. We hope to provide background knowledge and deeper context in order to support these conversations in those communities. Today is the fifth and final lecture of our series. We have Alaska Writer Laureate Ernestine Hayes with us today. And she'll be talking about crafting change through different creative writing techniques that support a personal journey towards equity. Ernestine Shakaklach Hayes belongs to the Wolf Clan of the Kaguantan Wolf House of the Kaguantan Clan of the Klingit Nation. Alaska writer, Alaska writer Laureate from 2016 to 2018. Hayes is the author of American Book Award recipient, Blonde Indian, an Alaska Native memoir, which received an honoring Alaska Indigenous Literature Award and Penn nonfiction finalist. Her book, The Tao of Raven, places narratives in the context of the box of daylight and the art of war. She is grandmother to four, great grandmother to three, and this University of Alaska Southeast Professor Emeritus makes her home in Juneau, not far from the Juneau Indian Village where she was born and raised. Remember, this is a, a live streamed through YouTube lecture series. So please share your comments with us, pose your questions so that we can ask those questions at the end of the lecture series. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ernestine Hayes. Thank you, Christy. Thank, thank you to Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for the invitation to participate in this meaningful series. Thank you to the other participants who have presented. It's an honor to be counted among you. We stand on living land that has been indigenous territory since time immemorial. We acknowledge the traditional homelands of the original people of this place, the Ok Kwan of the Tlingit Nation, who have lived on and loved and defended this storied land for hundreds of generations and thousands of years. We honor the ancestral, ancient, place-based knowledge of the Ok Kwan and express our gratitude for the inherent presence of past, current and future Ok Kwan generations. Gunatish Ok Kwan. Gunatish Ok Kwan. Gunatish. I was born in the Juneau Indian Village at the end of the Second World War when Alaska was still a territory. For the first few years of my life, I lived with my grandmother at the edge of the village while my mother was in and out of the hospital for tuberculosis. 
My grandmother spoke the Tlingit language. My mother understood it, but was not permitted to speak it. After my mother and I moved out of our old house at the edge of the village and into our own place to live alone, I heard our language spoken less and less, and before long I could only understand a few words and make a few sounds. But my grandmother had taught me things her own grandmother had taught her, things I in turn told my own grandchildren. She spoke to me of behavior and attitude. She told me stories and history, and she described the world to me. But even though my grandmother communicated to me a way of looking at my world, the movies I saw, the books I read, the lessons that I learned in school, all communicated another way of looking at myself. Winter in Tlingit Ani brings magpies and ravens. Eagles allow themselves to be more freely seen. We take measure of the wood, we sweep the stove, we unpack blankets from their summer store. We watch the mountains and the birds for marks of early snow. We wait. Unlike spring, winter does not bring more signs of spiders into the house. Like the bears, they must be holing up somewhere, or dying, or dead. My grandmother instructed me about spiders. Don't hurt them, she warned. Learn from them. Watch them. Learn. Spiders hunt. Although we might consider them bashful around humans, they show no such timid spirit with their prey. Even the web spinners remain at the, re at the ready, testing their woven silk for the struggle of unwary victims. Though their size is small, their nature persuades us to boldness. Spiders greet the world early. They wake and get busy early in the spring and early in the day. While the more familiar admonition for those who would lead a correct life is to wake before the ravens, rising before the spiders behooves us even more. The industry of spiders exemplifies right living. In the garden, spiders occasionally mimic the colors of nearby blooms. Their sly lurking reminds us that boldness and industry that are necessary and w without which we cannot prevail suffers from an absence of cunning. When still a newly married young woman, my grandmother traveled to Klukwan to visit her dying sister and retrieve the youngest child, a fresh-born new baby girl named Kakwe. With the child, she and her new husband, Ernie, traveled back to Juneau. In two or three years, her first natural child was born. She eventually gave birth to three boys and two girls. One baby boy died. My grandmother and my grandfather began drinking. Spiders are persistent. One sleepy morning years after I had begun teaching my own grandchildren about spiders, as I waited for warm water from the faucet in the hand sink, I glimpsed a spider whirling down the drain. I washed my hands at another sink and told myself there, there was nothing I could have done. I promised myself and the spider from now on I would more carefully attend to the presence of others. Normally, I trap spiders in a clean glass jar, blocking their escape with a stiff paper forced at the feet of their panic and release them onto the wet ground outside the front door. I send them all away with my good wishes. Now, I mourned my role in one spider's death. But what could I have done, I asked myself, in hopes of absolution? My grandmother's words held no room for pardon. I could have been precise. 
I could have watched. I could have been mindful. Hours later, I braved the hand basin again, just in time to witness that spider summiting the drain's final climb. Without a moment for rest, she began again her labor to overcome the sink's smooth walls. While I retrieved a sparkle glass and picked through recent cardboard, I thanked her for the lesson. She had reminded me to persevere. My grandmother's oldest child, the baby girl she'd retrieved from Klukwan, grew into a good worker. She worked at the cafe and in the hospital. She got pregnant. She remained unmarried and gave birth to a baby girl. My grandmother disapproved, but the grown daughter did a lot of work around the house and paid a lot of the bills and brought home a lot of groceries. So my grandmother could only scold and wait for my grandfather to come home drunk or sober. The grown daughter got tuberculosis and was sent to the hospital and my grandmother fit the new baby into her life. Spiders exhibit qualities to which I can only aspire. Patience, determination, common sense. I don't know what my grandmother must have meant for me to learn when she taught me not to disturb the spiders I discovered crawling along our walls or scurrying into corners. I know now that by teaching me to respect this one small creature's life, she taught me reverence for every living thing. By cautioning me to listen to spiders, she taught me to listen to the world. I don't flatter myself that my own grandchildren, now grown with families of their own but not yet exempt from my instruction, pay any more attention to my admonitions than I did to my own grandmother's lectures. But I do believe that one day they will remember me as I remember her, teaching me in a voice of scolding grandmotherly love, ready to dance with me ready to answer any question, ready to watch with silent wisdom while we listen for the whispers of others. After the oldest daughter came back home from the hospital, after all the children were grown or dead, after everyone had finally moved out of the house, my grandmother found herself alone. So she and her new man rented an apartment closer to town and drank most of the time. He often raised his hand to her. She wrapped herself in a knee-length coat and covered her face. When a young girl ran into the apartment to visit her grandmother, he held back his raised arm and turned away. She shapes her whip. She drops herself with utmost faith into the abyss. She and her sisters hang themselves from ceilings. Here and there, they focus themselves against the light. I sweep the hint of their shadows from my cheek. I come across them on the walls and find them crawling in slippery circles in the tub, unmindful of the coming flood. I retrieve a sparkled empty glass and pick through recent papers for stiff board. She senses me and tries to flee. But where can we run when we're trapped by porcelain walls? When her oldest daughter, the one she had retrieved from Klukwan, the one who didn't know she wasn't her mother's natural child, until one thoughtless moment when the knowledge was thrown at her across a room, across a fracture, across a broken life, left the state vowing never to return. My grandmother carried on with the rest of her life until one cold day in the midst of a taku wind, when she walked south on South Franklin Street instead of in the northerly direction that would have led her quickly home. Two weeks later, her oldest daughter forced her eyes to read the unwanted words in an unwelcome letter from a younger sister telling her of her mother's lonely death. Found on the ground in the cold winter, found wrapped in a knee-length coat, found alone. She shapes her whip, spinning one line, 
drops herself into the unknown, is swept unmindfully from unseen faces, finds the smooth destination, slips repeatedly from smooth, unforgiving walls, is flooded into the dark, clinging by desperation alone against the circle's side. When at last the flood ends, she climbs toward the light, only to be caught beneath the transparent glass and forced upon the cardboard, carried into the cold, dropped without ceremony onto the pebbles, the clover, the dirt. She overcomes every danger. She allows nothing to surprise her. As my grandmother always knew, we must be like this spider from our first day to the last. We must be willing to face every threat. When I was 15 years old, my mother and I moved to California where I stayed for 25 long years. I never came home, not once. But not a day went by that I didn't long for home. Finally, when I turned 40, my life in shambles, jobless, broke, not for the last time, homeless, not for the first time, my children grown or living with their father, I said, let me go home or let me die with my thoughts facing north. It took me eight months to get from San Francisco to Ketchikan, living in my car, sleeping in shelters, standing in food lines. I landed in Ketchikan on Mother's Day, 1986, and camped out until October, standing in the Salvation Army food lines on weekdays and fishing off the city dock on weekends. In October, I found a job, I found a place to stay. I sent for my mother and I sent for my sons, and two years later, we made it all the way back home to Juneau, and I know I love it more than if I'd never left. As the only child of a single mother, who always had a book or magazine in her hands, I learned early to love reading. I read my way through the public library, which was then in the building where the Juno Douglas City Museum is now located. Because the surest way to become a writer is to read, I fancied early on that I could write. From childhood and through all my years in California, and even after I came back home to Juno, I wrote at essays, and I wrote at novels, and I wrote at poems. But I didn't write with intent, and I didn't know how to express the truth I'd carried all those years until I signed up for a college writing class, and I learned discipline. Even though I'd never finished high school, I dropped out in the 10th grade, got a GED in San Francisco, learned to type, got a job, and that was the end of that. I'd always said, maybe one of these days I'll go to college. So just as when I turned 40, I said, let me go home. When I turned 50, I said, let me go to college. I signed up for a two-year program at the University of Alaska Southeast, and then I switched over to a four-year program. And then, even though I'd promised myself I would never leave Juno again, I moved for two winters to Anchorage and earned a Master's of Fine Art in Creative Writing and Literary Arts. And I came back home to Juno and began teaching at the University of Alaska Southeast, first as an adjunct, then as a part-time term appointment, then a full-time temporary assistant professor for several years, and finally I received tenure the year before I retired as a full professor emeritus that at the college education had, had begun those many years before. In addition to teaching creative writing workshops and literature courses, I had the honor of working with first-year students who came to the university underserved, and as a result, tested into pre-college composition. I designed and taught an accelerated program that allowed students to enter college level composition courses the following semester, helping them stay on track and supporting their work in other required courses. In those classes, we learned broad writing techniques applicable to any academic writing. 
And here I will share with you the three most important rules to writing that we only wish we could apply to our lives. Revision, revision, revision. In our creative writing workshops, we explored technique and craft. I imagined it was like most other forms of art, for example, carving, in which, if we were given one semester, the most important lesson, I believed, would probably be how to hold the blade. So we practiced craft. We practiced selecting and arranging words to create images in the minds of our readers. We practiced inviting readers into our world. We presented characters in ways that showed their roles with words that formed certain expectations that created impressions we desired. We manipulated perspectives. We gave expression to particular points of view. We perfected choices of diction and syntax to evoke emotion in our readers. We created reality creating characters and building worlds, presenting truths and the imagined histories of our created worlds, we understood that our characters possessed concerns and events that were not clearly or openly part of the stories we were writing, but were critical elements to our characters' stories nonetheless. Indeed, there are some, and I am among them, who believe that Everything is alive, everything has life, and that includes stories. Stories are alive, and we are their conduit. Or perhaps we are only one of the many ways that stories, like nature herself, present themselves to the world. A few weeks ago, I watched a series about the history of cinema titled The Story of Film. As I watched, I was struck by the narrative, the history and development of cinematic technique. It seemed to me that comparisons could be drawn, for example, attention to detail, use of light, direction, distance. In fact, everything about its history and purpose seemed not only illustrative of cinematic technique, but also that of creative writing and indeed all forms of art. An important point in the series, perhaps the most critical, remarked that while box office and ratings are the most commonly cited aspect of a movie's success, unsurprising in our, in our culture of consumer capitalism, it's not money that drives cinema. Ideas drive cinema. Ideas innovate, ideas excite, ideas give life, and ideas can change the world. Ideas, like stories, like our lives, like everything upon this earth are alive. Those ideas become the truth we carry. Another of the points of craft was to keep in mind that characters arrive to scenes from somewhere, and when the scene concludes, Characters are on the, their way to somewhere else. Events proceed and lives continue. Lives and stories demonstrate continuity. Let's remember that truth about ourselves. When we do good work, when we show up to support, to protest, to discuss, to listen, learn, and teach, let's remember where we've been and where we're going. Let's make sure our work displays the continuity so important, not only to effective writing, to effective filmmaking, but also to the composition of our lives. And let's remember that the same is true for everyone, whether we think we know their story or not. Now I will share a story that illustrates continuity in lives that came together for what seems now like just a brief time. So please think about the continuity of the lives that appear in this story. Now, Chamai, she was a deadhead. She reeked of the Grateful Dead the way her long skirts reeked of Humboldt skunk. 
Colorful silk scarves loose around her waist, long straight hair braided with beads and twined with feathers, barefoot. She strutted and twirled down the street, announcing to one and all she was a medicine woman, a mystic. She told the world, here I am. She lived in a cabin on the ridge and traveled back and forth to town in an indecisive old jeep, painted camouflage, its hood missing, tires bald, exposed engine coughing and sputtering and shaking the car and everyone inside. She'd been born in the Aleutian Islands at the end of the Second World War, given an American name, raised by American standards. She'd had two baby girls while she was still a girl, but she wasn't allowed to keep them, those babies, those baby girls. She was persuaded by family and church to give them up. Then she took off for California, Haight-Ashbury in the 60s, flowers, love, she took a new name, which means hello in the old language. It was the only word she confidently recalled. In San Francisco, she had a baby boy, his father a black musician. She named that baby Antelope. A couple of years later, in the Sierra Nevada foothills, she had another baby boy by another musician, this time Hispanic, and she named that baby Yuba. She raised those boys on organic gardening and the Grateful Dead. By the time we met, her boys were almost grown. Together we went to shows in San Francisco, hitchhiking to the city and staying in the hate with old friends. We saw Greg Allman, John Cipollini, George Thurgood in the clubs and danced at dead concerts in the park. Then we hitchhiked back to the foothills, taking come-as-you-are rides, laughing, telling stories, reliving the music, and everywhere we traveled, I saw her tell the world, here I am. Over the years, she'd wondered about those baby girls she'd given up so long ago. When she found that they'd been adopted in the States, she joined a locator service and saw no reason ever to go back to an outdated world where she felt she'd never belonged. Late one afternoon, that camo jeep pulled up on the street in front of the shelter where I slept when I was homeless in the city. The motor jumped and sputtered while her two boys kept it running. She climbed out of the jeep and ran to my side. Guess what? I found my girl. We're going to meet her right now. We hugged and smiled, her feathers dancing. Then she jumped back into the jeep and they bounced away in a cloud of patchouli, her braids waving a happy goodbye. I saw Chamai again a few weeks later. That daughter had been adopted into a self-righteous, intolerant farming family in the Sacramento Valley. Whatever that girl's fantasies about finally meeting her birth mother, they must have been instantly crushed when she saw a long-haired hippie woman pull up in a camo jeep, Creole and Mestizo half-brothers alongside. The visit had been strained, kept secret, quickly finished, and Shemai's beloved daughter had told her never to call her again. I found my other daughter last week. We're going to see her in Santa Cruz. She glanced at her waiting sons. What if she doesn't like us? Shemai couldn't buy a new car. She couldn't dress differently. She couldn't leave her sons at home. All she could do was show up and say, here I am. A few days later, I watched that camo jeep sputter up the street one final time. The boys and Chimai inside with big smiles all over their rainbow family faces. Chamai leaned happily out the window as they drove slowly by. Guess what, she hollered. My daughter loves us. I have grandchildren, black and Hispanic. We're all going to a dead concert this summer. Love you. See you. Goodbye. I never saw Chamai again. I guess I never will. Her willingness to meet her second daughter after the grand disappointment of the first was true courage. Her success with that second daughter was true good fortune. I wandered in the darkness. I heard a woman cry. 
I saw that woman get her baby back. Knowing her became a gift. I saw the substance of courage and good fortune, and I learned that sometimes it's enough just to show up in the world, just to show up and say, here I am. Even though you could say that Shemai and I appeared in many scenes together, Golden Gate Park, North Beach, the foothills, I really didn't know that much of Chimai's story, nor did she know much of mine. We didn't keep in touch after I left, and I don't know how her life unfolded, but I trust that her life maintained its continuity, and I trust that mine did as well. There are truths that I carry because of her. Well, as I said, I'm retired and I'm indulging in a natural inclination to stay home, not to venture into public places, to keep my own company. All that to say I watched another video, more than one more. This one followed acting workshop classes, not as gripping for me as the film on filmmaking series, but I did draw lessons, the most memorable of which arose when the instructor, director, Nina Foch, explained what scenes require from actors. A scene occurs when truths come together. Characters show up with specific intent. Each character is changed by the other's intent, and the character's truth is shaped by the intent that they bring to the interaction to the scene. We bring our truths to our interactions, to our scenes, as it were. Our truth and our intent resonate beyond the moment. Like artists performing on stage, like artists performing on screen, like writers creating worlds, let us, too, be always mindful of the intent and truth we bring to the scenes that make up the stories of our lives. Another element of craft to keep in mind is that of point of view. Who narrates the stories we tell? From what perspective are those stories told? What about the stories we believe? Who is the original narrator of the stories we repeat? Who is the original narrator in the stories we teach? To whom are those stories being told and for what purpose? Creative writing, filmmaking, acting, singing, painting, carving, cooking, teaching, playing, washing clothes, washing dishes, resting, dancing, laughing, crying, everything is art. Our lives are the stories that are being told. The revelations that apply to creative performance apply to the art of our lives. We present stories from particular points of view, like that of our characters, our own words and actions evoke emotions and form expectations. We create reality and we invite others to join us. We arrive with intent. We have been changed, we are changed, and we change others. I watched another one, and it could be that the lesson I took from the dance workshop might be the most useful of all. The workshop instructor explained that from the youngest age, dancers watch themselves as they practice in front of mirrors, and when they're on stage, the audience stands in for the mirror and acts as their reflection. The instructor emphasized that dancers must see themselves. The reflection, whether in the mirror or in the eyes of the audience, shape the dancer's identity. And we know this is a truth we all carry. We are formed by the reflection of ourselves in others, and others are formed by the reflection of themselves in our eyes. To that end, Consider where you see yourself as I read this story. Summer days in Juneau were sweeter when I was a girl. 
the breezes more gentle, the sun's rays warmer, laughter more spontaneous, the possible future imprecise but somehow bright. The distinctions that divided me from other children, wrinkled dirty clothes, absence of family at school time celebrations, unclean fingernails and dirty hands, no doubt a salty, unwashed smell, had eased upon my mother's return from her long tubercular stay in the hospital, and the coming separation from my classmates that would arrive with puberty was still no more than a wistfully approaching shadow. At that in-between age, anyone I met on my summer day wanderings might become a one-day friend. Anyone might join me for a rambling day of hiking up Mount Roberts, wading down Gold Creek, fishing off the city dock. So it was, that morning I met two or three classmates, not quite strangers, not at all friends, white kids who lived in neighborhoods I didn't know, who wore clothes that were purchased from places other than the mail order catalogs my mother and I so eagerly anticipated. After some hellos, we decided to walk over to the docks to try out the new fishing pole one of them had just been given by his father. I promised to take a picture with my mother's Kodak she had lovingly consigned to me for the summer. Our chatter was that of children, the excitement of a nibble now and then neither fulfilled nor defeated by success or by failure. I sensed the possibilities contained in friendship with these extraordinary children, the promise of entry, a relief from freedom, the security of belonging. Along with their friendship might come comfort, might come knowledge, might come understanding. Along with their friendship might come acceptance. I might be included. I might belong. The blonde-haired boy began to snicker. Look at that drunk Indian carrying that fish. Let's get out of here. He pointed southward down the dock and began to wind in his line. I followed his eyes in the direction of his pointing finger to see an old man in a greasy wool jacket, dark fisherman's knit cap covering his head, a fresh halibut glistening from a length of twine wrapped around his fist. I squinted. That's my grandfather, I announced to the boy and his fidgety, giggling companions. Everyone tried to be quiet as my grandfather walked toward us. The other children, their derision ill-concealed by poor attempts to cover their snorts of laughter, took hesitant steps backward as my grandfather neared. Finally, we all stood too close to one another within the distance of a man's height his reach, his life. The white children I dared to imagine as my friends staging their retreat behind me, ready to dash for the safety of another world. My grandfather in front of me offering a whiskered smile, saluting me with the heavy flatfish he proudly held up for my regard and admiration, I at the torn seam of two worlds. Dreams faded like dappling sunlight, the only choice, no choice at all, to embrace the life that had been designed for me no less than the lives that had been designed by these children's parents for us all, to give back the proud smile my grandfather offered, to know that despite the fish slime, despite the day's old whiskers, despite the headache and lost fingers and sharp grief, here was a man who understood what it meant to be proud. I took his picture and gave him a hug. I admired the salt fresh fish. We both knew he would sell it to some lucky cook and would use the money to buy more wine. We both knew it would take far more than a sunny afternoon for me to make friends of these softened pink children. We both knew that those children's fathers, though they ran the town and ran the schools and ran the courts and ran our lives, 
would never possess the courage that my grandfather showed every day just by getting up and going on. We both knew that even though halibut cheeks were my mother's favorite summer meal, and even though there was no chance that we might fry one up tonight, my grandfather loved me as much as any grandfather had ever loved his wild, unreliable, unpredictable grandchild. Where do we see ourselves in such a story? Where do our students see themselves? Where do our leaders, whether elected or appointed or self-appointed, see themselves? Where do we see ourselves in today's lived stories? Who fills the roles in the stories of our lives? In what role do we face every threat today? Our lives are the story and the craft. Our lives are the art. Our lives are the carver's blade, the painter's brush, the writer's pen. We chop wood, we carry water, we carry truth. My family has lived upon and loved this place for year upon year. My three great-grandchildren represent the seventh generation as counted in white man's records. Although we are Sheet Gaquan and will always remain so, my family has deep roots here in Ak Kwan territory. And we are not alone in our love of this place. How deep the roots of the original people to this land. How deep the love. How attached to the land their many generations. At the beginning of my talk, I acknowledge the presence of the Ak Kwan upon whose land we stand. Together we honored the ancestral, ancient, place-based knowledge of the Ak Kwan, and we expressed our gratitude for the presence of past, current, and future Ak Kwan generations. Just as we acknowledge the past and future presence of the original people of this place, let us also acknowledge the many who are homeless here in their own homeland. Let us also acknowledge the many who are hungry in a land where Raven meant them to flourish. Let us acknowledge our roles in a system designed for their failure, incarceration, their poverty, let us not be content to say we honor your past unless we acknowledge present circumstance and align our truth to an equitable future. Allow me now to make two points that it is my practice to make at every opportunity. To those of you who made, may have heard these points and may have heard the stories that I have given you, I offer no apology. Just as the supposed righteousness of manifest destiny and American expansionism is repeated in school lessons, films, novels, and every other form of social communication, these points must also be repeated until their plain truth is recognized. Let us make these points our truth. First, Almost every source describes the long record of native use and occupation that took place before European contact as prehistory. Indigenous groups, however, possess histories of thousands of years of occupancy and exodus, relocation and settlement, exploration and discovery embedded throughout the generations in legal process, artistic declaration, symbolic regalia, and oral tradition at least as accurately and in many cases more accurately than the European system of writing that has been used for so many years to remove rights and appropriate lands. We must always remember 
that before colonial contact, native cultures possessed vigorous legal systems, effective educational systems, efficient health systems, elaborate social orders, elegant philosophical and intellectual insights, sophisticated kinship systems, complex languages, profitable trade systems, every social institution needed for a culture to flourish for thousands of years. Second, we do well to remind ourselves that had the colonial invasion not taken place, indigenous people would still be living in the 21st century. Our lives would still be modern. Paved roads, airports, and Wi-Fi would still occur. Some things would be different. We would all be speaking our own languages. Our rivers would be clean. Our children would be receiving educations meant to lead to their success. We would not be so vulnerable to incarceration, alcoholism, poverty. We would be healthy. Make these two points part of the truth you carry into the scenes of your life. Make these truths part of your truth. Decolonize, smash the patriarchy, undo capitalism, black lives matter, resist. Gunnelchich, Gunnelchich. Well, as Audrey, the question is, I don't know if I can repeat that verbatim. Okay. The question is, in thinking about revision, 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 what suggestions do you have for our educators exploring concepts such as institutional racism and social injustices? Thank you for that question. It's a very thoughtful, provocative question. Although the suggestions that we have and share with one another are normally, and all we can do is, is make our own individual changes and be, um, be mindful of the, of the change and influence that we have on others. The truth is, it is systemic. The truth is, as Audre Lord says, it is the master's house that needs to be dismantled. We can worry about and explore and even complain about individual bigotry and so on, but that doesn't, that does not solve our systemic problem. Although I don't enjoy quoting and citing European white men, scholars all the time, um, it turns out that they are the ones who are most quoted, right? Those are the ones that we know most about. And so I'm going to quote a German um, uh, mathematician by the name of Max Planck. And I don't have the quote verbatim, but it is that when a new truth occurs, is discovered, so to speak, you don't have to re-educate the people who now believe it. All you have to do is raise the next generation believing that truth. And there is your work, your good work. Don't worry about changing your neighbor. Don't worry about Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving. Raise the children with the knowledge of true history, with the knowledge of your truth. And that is the way that we will rebuild the house and it will no longer be the master's house.
How do we as community members who may not be educators show the courage that you mentioned as we advocate for our children and find our own voices as it relates to our educational systems? Finding courage is, is, uh, is not something easily done, is it? So I used to tell my grandchildren, you don't have to like what I tell you to do. All you have to do is act like you like it. So that's what I'm going to say to you. You don't have to have courage. All you have to do is act like you have courage. And that's what I do several times, all the time. Right? That's what I do. So we act like we have courage. We act like we know what we're doing. And somehow the work is good. So and that's, that's my suggestion, that if we wait until we feel brave, you'll be like me and stay home watching videos all the time. <laughs> I've been asked if I have any parting words, and I would like to, again, thank everyone. And um, I would also like to repeat the last words um, that I said at the end, which is decolonize. Smash the patriarchy. It ain't going to smash itself. Undo capitalism. Black lives matter. Resist. Gonna teach. Ah, gonna teach. Gonna teach, Ernestine. Thank you for your parting words, your parting wisdom, um, and to close out our culturally responsive education lecture series. Um, Thank you all for tuning in on YouTube. Um, please remember, we will have a new lecture series starting next month, October 1st. Our first lecturer will be David Boxley, same time, noon to 1 p.m. Again, thank you all for tuning in. Gunish Chish.